I think it's true, it's got more frequent flyer points and it's covered more than Bob Ansett and uh, what's his name, Doyle. Um, the fellow that runs Qantas put together and Branson. <laughs> he never stops. We're very fortunate to have him here tonight. And also Greg, who is probably the longest standing member of the society here, at least tonight, probably. Foundation member, I think. So it's really special that he's come all the way from Mount Toma to be with us. And Stuart's just donning a microphone and getting his stuff. more species have been found in the last 10 years than, than at any other time in history. And in fact, more species have been found in the last 10 years, probably than the last 30 or 40 years combined. The reasons for this are many, uh, but mainly because carnivorous plants generally live in really inaccessible places or little explored places that only now are becoming accessible or understood or thoroughly botanized. I was very lucky to undertake a series of expeditions 10 years ago with two really good friends, uh, Dr. Alistair Robinson on the right here, uh, sorry, on your left, <laughs> and a lovely uh, fellow called Volker Heinrich, um, who's from Germany but lives in the Philippines. Um, and we, we travel across the Philippine archipelago uh, to photograph Nepenthes. At the time, in 2007, I was writing two books and looked at all of the Nepenthes that were recognized at that time. There have been many that have been described since then, but at that time, no one had documented all of them, and in fact, many of them had never even been photographed. So I set out um, to write these two, which actually became part of a series of 25 books in the end. But these two were focused specifically on the Nepenthes and also Cephalotus. Um, they're called Pitcher Plants of the Old World because I'd already written one on the, the New World, the American Pitcher Plants. Anyway, um, over about, I don't know, about three years, we climbed about 300 mountains, I can't even remember, all across, particularly in Borneo, Sumatra, Sulawesi, New Guinea, and other places in Southeast Asia. Um, like I said, at that time, there was some really, it was a really exciting time because there were some complete blanks on the map in terms of understanding carnivorous plants. And one such blank was definitely the island of Palawan. So I don't know whether people know of Palawan or not. I certainly didn't before I, I started doing all these trips. Palawan is an island in the Philippines. Um, it's, there's a long, narrow, sausage-shaped island north of Borneo. And it was really, really, really interesting for a lot of different reasons. Um, there had been, uh, since World War II, there had been lots of troubles there. There had been an Islamic uh, insurgency in the south. There had been several military um, issues. And so for certainly the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, very, very, very few people from the outside had gone there, certainly in terms of studying plants and animals. Um, it, it was, at that time, 10 years ago, it, it still pretty much was, was little known by tourists. It was still pretty, pretty remote. It's changed massively in the last 10 years, and now it's a pretty popular destination. But just 10 years ago, it was just at that cusp, and um, yeah, it really wasn't frequently visited. And in terms of Nepenthes, it pretty much was completely a blank. And that was really interesting because it occurred right next to Borneo, the great center of Nepenthes diversity. Borneo, as I'm sure you know, has more species, and certainly more, more diversity of Nepenthes than anywhere else on Earth. And lots of the mountains that occur in Palawan are geologically really similar. They have ultramafic rock, which means it's really good for localized endemic Nepenthes and it's dead close in the Penthes, to, to, sorry, to Borneo, and winds are known to blow seed um, of different species in between the two islands. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was connected with land bridges in the past, which may, meant that there'd been an exchange of, of animals and plants. So it's a really, really interesting island. At the time, only two species of Nepenthes were known from Palawan. Um, one called Nepenthes mira, which, uh, this is the one on your left, which um, at the time, as far as I'm aware, it hadn't been photographed. And another one, which was equally obscure, called Nepenthes philippinensis, which no one really knew what it really was that clearly as well. So um, people knew there were kind of Nepenthes there, but didn't really know what types. And there was a third one that had been sighted um, in 1899, if I'm not mistaken, 
called Nepenthes Deniana. And this one was found on a mountain called, uh, called in the old descriptions, it was called uh, Mount Polga. And this mountain had been lost. It wasn't known exactly where it was on the maps. The specimens of the Nepenthes were destroyed in the World War II bombing of the Manila Herbarium. So no one had any idea what this Nepenthes um, Deniana was. We actually rediscovered this one as well in a later expedition, but that's kind of a different story. Anyway, Palawan was special because all along the length of the island, there were a, chain, a long chain of mountains. So all along the length of the island, there's about eight major peaks. And most of them, no one had ever been up, certainly in terms of botany and zoology. Um, so that was really, really interesting. Anyway, um, 10 years ago, the, the three of us, Alistair Falker and I, landed in Palawan. We, we went by, there was nowhere to go there, if I remember correctly, by plane. We had to get there by boat. And we, um, we very quickly found Nepenthes philippinensis. And this is a really cool Nepenthes. It forms massive sheets of leaves and pitches. And it completely swamps um, even trees like here. They can, grow, they can grow really tall. They can grow up to like eight meters tall. They just cover anything they grow on. And you can see all the hundreds, hundreds of pitches hanging down. And a few flowers. And a lot of flowers, absolutely. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> They're not, it's not the most spectacular of species. Um, it produces pictures about this big, and the lowers are bright red, and the uppers can be yellow or green, or sometimes red. But that wasn't why we'd, we'd come here. Um, we specifically had gone to Palawan to try and visit some of those uh, unexplored mountains. And one of them in particular, the second highest peak on the entire island, was particularly interesting. Basically, a few years before we had gone, in the early 2000s, um, a load of missionaries had gone to this mountain, it's called Mount Victoria, and they tried to climb up the mountain to install a repeater station because they had a missionary outpost on a valley beyond. And what they'd done, they'd climbed up the mountain uh, without any guides, without any planning, without any equipment, without any supplies, literally nothing, got up somewhere into the valley, uh, up onto the slopes of the mountain, but got hopelessly lost. They, they couldn't get down again. They spent three or four days just walking randomly in circles and eventually radioed for help. And um, they, they were going to be rescued by helicopter from, from the capital, Puerto Princesa, but in the end, some guides went up and rescued them. But the guides went, they didn't find them straight away. They went right to the summit of the mountain, then worked their way down. And these guides, as far as it were known, the local, they were local hunters, were the very first people ever to reach the summit of this mountain. And they reported plants with giant cup-like flowers, giant pitcher-like cups. Um, and anyway, well, after all this ordeal, ordeal had happened, and they got, finally got the missionaries back down from the, the mountain, they would written a, a load of reports in newspapers. And these were published uh, quite widely in the Philippines. And Falker, who lives in the Philippines, had read this. And of course, immediately thought that these giant cup plants, these weird plants with cup-shaped flowers must be Nepenthes. So that's why we targeted it and wanted to get to its summit to find out what those weird plants were. So, landing in Puerto Princesa, um, they're really, it, it, it's very different now, but at the time, the only way to get around were in these Philippine jeepneys, these very charismatic buses. And it's right the way down to the south, and I remember very clearly being stuck in these jeepneys for about eight hours and it being absolutely full of animals in boxes, with chickens and all sorts of animals screaming as we were going down. I think there was even a goat at the back as well. And um, these, this, this was a fighting cock inside. They, they carry them around because they're very, they're very well looked after and cared for. Um, uh, anyway, we finally got down to the, the village, or a small town rather, near the mountains called Nara, and went to the mayor's office and explained what we wanted to do. Uh, this, in the Philippines, it's called the Barangay Captain. And you have to kind of get their blessing to, to, to climb a mountain, uh, or at least get permission to go through that area to get to the mountain. So we met the captain. He was very supportive and took us out in this little yellow bus, um, which was one of the very few vehicles at that time there, and um, took us off-road as far as the tracks would go towards the mountain. And we reached a little, just basically this little house here, and met some hunters. And it just so happened that we managed to track down one 
of the men who had helped the missionaries down from the mountain. Um, he, he pointed exactly the peak that he went up to, and at that very moment it appeared through the mist. And there's this double peaked mountain up here, rising above the clouds. It's not actually very high, it's about 1,800 meters, which isn't actually very high, um, but um, yeah, it was just because it was so enigmatic and, uh, and remote and interesting. Anyway, we, um, we sighted this, this, I remember really clearly, we sighted this peak through the mist from the lowlands and wondered what, what this weird Nepenthes was, or could be rather, on its summit. So we started out. There were apps, and these guys were going out after, after boar. There'd be three or four men with a team of dogs, and generally big bamboo spears with a metal tip. And um, yeah, they'd literally go and spear pigs and drag them to a place where they could butcher them and uh, meet back in their rattan backpacks. Um, so it really was pretty wild. Um, anyway, as we started going along the rivers, we saw a few of these Nepenthes philippinensis and started to wonder could it actually be that the missionaries and the guide, the guides rather, had just seen the Nepenthes philippinensis? Was that the only plant on the mountain? Would the whole, the whole trip be in vain and we not actually find anything of particular interest because we've already seen philippinensis? Um, so we saw loads of these plants again climbing up. Um, there's several conifer species and they climbed all the way up those um, and saw their pictures again, but nothing new. Um, and interestingly, on the along the trail up to Mount Victoria, along the route, they all grow across these rocks right near waterfalls. It's incredibly spectacular with waterfalls right next to them, and the plants just grow rooted to the bare rock or cracks in the rock. Um, some of them are quite pretty, with beautiful peristones, with red um, striped peristones and red spots inside. And you can see here um, the, the track, the, the path which was in the waterfalls and in the rivers. It's getting harder and harder and more slippery, tougher. Um, the guys in particular with their big backpacks, we had eight or nine porters with equipment and supplies. Um, they perhaps found it particularly hard crossing the rocks because of the weight. But little by little we, we went along and were camping just rough in the forest, wherever we could make um, yeah, wherever we could make a camp. Each night we just had to machete an area, um, put up tents or hammocks as, as best we could. Um, some of the waterfalls and, and rapids were quite, quite, uh, quite strong. There had been a pretty big storm that had just come through the Philippines the week before. And the rivers, yeah, were up to knee height or waist height, and some bits were pretty, pretty fast. Uh, others were really easy and, and shallow. We were absolutely soaked. But as we got higher and higher, we reached um, the, the, the remnants of trails from a different valley, and people obviously sometimes came up here to collect Almasiga resin. This is resin of a massive tree called Agatis philippinensis. And people with machetes hack at the side of it and bleed the tree for this resin. And this is unbelievable stuff. Um, if you light it, even when it's wet, it bursts into flames. You, you wouldn't believe, um, you wouldn't believe it. But you, you can chuck it in the water, and finally you bring it out, it'll splutter and spit a bit, but it'll still burn. Um, and, and it will burn for ages, and it burns really hot. So this stuff is really quite valuable. And even though this is incredibly remote, and no one, you're not even the hunters went up to this height, it seems every six months maybe a, a wandering nomad would go through, machete the trees, and the next six months come back and collect the resin. And also the problem is because people wound it like this, and it gets covered with, with resin, if that was set fire, the flames would just kill the tree. So um, it makes them really vulnerable if there's any, any hint of fire. They just burn because of all that resin like covering them. But this resin is pretty valuable. Anyway, well, the vegetation and the wildlife was getting pretty strange. Um, there were bright blue mushrooms and pink maidenhair ferns. The developing leaves were bright pink, which I'd never seen anything like. There were lots of interesting uh, insects. Aquamarinas, apparently. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it's almost see-through, the green as well. Anyway, there was, um, we had a bit of an incident. One of our camps, we named them after each other, and uh, we named one of the camps Camp Robinson after Alistair's second name, it's Alistair Robinson. And I think it was the second or third night, I noticed the guides with their tins of, we all had tins of tuna, and the guides had massive machetes, meter long, 
machetes for cutting the, the trail where we needed to go out of the rivers. And um, the guides were kind of trying to jimmy open the cans. So with a, a meter long blade, kind of oh. jimmy open, push it in, then move it across. The next bit, move it across and the circle around the, you know, the perimeter of the can. And whenever I, see, I had seen them do this previously, I'd given them my, had one of those little pen knife openers and um, helped them. But each time that I wasn't there, they'd, they'd continue trying to do it this way, which, which after the rain of that day made the cans really slippery. So you can probably imagine what, what happened. One of the guides had been jerking, trying to open this can and slipped, and the machete blade had gone right down his, his hand. And it, it was quite deep, not massively deep, but probably a, a century, a meter and a half, right down across his hand. Um, and we all were straight away like, look, okay, fine, we must go back and get you attention tomorrow. We, we must go down and get this sorted. But I think it was a pride thing or something. I was like, no, absolutely not. I don't care. If you guys go down, I'm going on anyway. So I'm going on. Um, so anyway, I gave him butterfly stitches and bandaged him up. And on the photos after this, you'll see that guy with a bandage on his hand. Um, it, it really was all the way down his hand and I think he was slightly down onto his part of his arm as well. But um, he insisted, absolutely insisted to keep going. So we, we did the next morning. Um, we ran into the ruins of what I think was the, the ruins of the, the missionaries where they, where they camped. There's an old abandoned A-frame and um, like a, a bit where they've been sleeping under the A-frame, just all rotting away from probably six or seven years earlier. But we found what I think was the ruins of their camp and then came to a massive wall. Uh, well, it wasn't actually that big. It was maybe about five meters tall and um, it had a waterfall flowing down part of it. And, it, it almost looked as if we'd just have to turn around and go back. But the guy who had been up there further with us managed to find a route, went along a bit, and then there was a, there's a broken ledge, and he took us up the broken ledge. And finally, we got to the upper slopes, and the vegetation changed straight away. We came out of forest, straight into this mossy, uh, montane scrub, and it was covered with these rocks, these ultramathic rocks, which is really special for Nepenthes. This is the, the rock where all the really cool, unique species of Borneo grow on. So we we're really happy to see this. But it was really jagged, and I know a few people, including Glenn, have been up uh, Victoria. Um, and I'm sure you'll testify, much of it is like blades. It's all loose, so even though it looks pretty tough here, as you climb across it, it all clangs and moves around. And many of it is, is incredibly sharp. If you fall on it, you absolutely will cut yourself. Um, and in some places, it, it's almost like blades. Uh, but there's just sheets lying on top of each other all the way up to the summit. You have to kind of climb on them and scramble along them. And many of them, yeah, like I say, are moving. But f slowly, in the mist, we got higher and higher and higher. And then suddenly, out of the mist, out of this weird plants, um, suddenly we saw these these massive Nepenthes plants with long flowering inflorescences. And just from seeing that, just that one little glimpse of the plants, we knew straight away it, it was something new. Um, it was just mass, some of them are like a meter across. And there's only a few Nepenthes in the world that are like, like that size uh, in this habitat. And these big flower spikes, we knew it was something new. But we thought we'll, we'll crack onto the summit, then work our way down, and um, see where the best plants are. So we climbed a bit higher, and the clouds kind of dissipated as we, as we got a bit higher, and had these incredible views over the valleys. And finally got to the summit. You'll notice that's the guy there with the bandaged uh, hand. He was the original guy that had gone up and rescued the missionaries, and also obviously the guy that had, had his uh, had macheted his hand, unfortunately. So um, we finally got to the summit, exhausted. I think this was day three. Um, and then started to go and have a look at this weird plant that, that we just discovered. Um, it was really interesting because it had pictures that the first ones we saw were striped with black and green in really unusual combinations. Again, not really like any others that, that, that had been described at that time. And um, the leaves were covered with brown hairs. And they're really fat, rigid, thick leaves, leathery leaves 
all fringed with these orange hairs. And the pitchers themselves have these big mouths. But what really set them apart was their size. Some of the biggest pitchers were well over 30 centimeters. Some of them were huge, totally big enough to put your hand into. Um, but they were all funnel shaped, all really thin um, bases going up to a, a really wide circular mouth. And it was totally clear that they were not like any other that had been known at that time. And they were really variable in color, and most of them were full of life. Many people, I'm sure, know that Nepenthes pitches, they're not just a part of a plant, they're an ecosystem. And there are often, in some cases, even dozens of species of animals that live inside the pitcher. And many of them live nowhere else on Earth. So when you see these plants in the wild, they're not just plants. They actually can have miniature worlds inside their pitchers with different trophic levels. So some of them have algae and plants that live inside them, and have grazers that live off the plants, and hunters that hunt the plant, the carnivores that eat the grazers, and then different levels of other carnivores that predate the, the, the system inside them. All of them have a complex ecosystem so there could be a whole miniature world that even can have animals as big as frogs. Many frogs lay their tadpoles in here, and crabs often might sometimes temporarily live in them, um, beetle larvae, mosquito larvae, all kinds of animals inside of them. So they're pretty cool. And these pictures had loads of life. And still to this day, no one has ever studied what animals live in them. So you probably are looking, or could well be looking, at a new species of, of um, mosquito. No one knows. Anyway, the pictures themselves were really, really colourful and had beautiful rims lined with, um, with stripes and beautiful patterns inside. And this was the most beautiful picture that I saw um, up there. It be really colourful, but all of them were that funnel-shaped trap that distinguished them from all other species. Um, but like I say, the thing that really set them apart was their size. Many of them were over 30 centimetres. And um, if I remember correctly, some were like 35, 40. Some of them were really big. Um, they're really beautiful. There's a photo of Alistair holding one. So he's about my size, roughly. So you can just see how, how big they are, something like that. Um, so yeah, they're really, really, <clears throat> really big. On a later expedition, it wasn't actually this trip, but on a later expedition, because we, we've been taking groups back to this mountain to photograph it and see it. Um, Alistair found um, a dead shrew uh, inside one of the pitchers. Um, uh, so yeah, he, he randomly found this, and then two months later, had a different, took a different group there and photographed the same shrew, the exact same picture. And the plant had accidentally trapped a shrew, and then a few months later, it had been digested or broken down into just a husk and. Um, quite grossly, he took it out and put it on his hand and took this photo. Um, I should point out, no carnivorous plant has evolved to catch and kill uh, rodents. Um, it's often exaggerated and people call them rat-eating plants or you know, mice-eating plants. It's not true. None of them have ever evolved to catch and kill vertebrates. But under very rare circumstances, the very biggest ones can catch animals, in fact, as big as rats. The Penthes Raja um, was documented even in the, in the, in the 19th century <coughs> by Spencer St. John catching a rat. And other plants that were originally well-known to sometimes catch small birds, um, and Drusra, some Drusra also have been documented to that effect in the wild as well. A friend of mine took these photos, and you can see how incredibly variable it is. Some plants produce pictures that are simply pure green or, or pure yellow, Others produce ones that are spotted, and that's definitely the, um, the typical form. Um, and they often age and go pure purple, or even pure black, just before they die. So yeah, they're pretty variable in color when you see them. And this one, just as it was about to die, uh, was, was pure, almost pure black. Um, but yeah, I can say, just from all those characteristics, and also by the, the structure of its flower, we knew straight away it was a new one. And we studied it for quite a while. We had a day up there studying it. And, taking measurements and photographing it, and even found some tiny little baby juvenile ones that we photographed to document their juvenile pictures. But bizarrely, um, we also noticed that it was grown side by side by a brand new species of sundew, another carnivorous plant. And at that time, this plant 
uh, was not named. Um, it had, to be fair, been seen by other people, I think. Um, I think it had been seen previously on Mount Kinvalius, Mara, Paris, Burr, but no one had named it, and no one really knew what it was. So we documented that. It turned out that it was um, definitely a new species. And a friend of mine, Andreas Fleischmann, and can't kind of named, so we named it um, Drosera Ultramafica. Um, and it was quite interesting because it produces almost three-dimensional globes of sticky leaves that are lined with these droplets of, of sparkling blue. So it's pretty crazy to think that there was a, a brand new Nepenthes and a brand new Sundew, like right next to each other, that had been forgotten, lost in time. And it's so interesting to think how these plants have lived there for tens, hundreds of thousands of years, and no one had ever appreciated them or, or, or seen them or, or looked at them or studied them or realized how special they were. They just lived there in silence, evolving over millennia um, through, yeah, through the mists of the mountain summit. Anyway, it was time for us to start our descent. So we started climbing back, back down, and um, this is the guide again with the, uh, with the in Japan at the front, and they're just so hardcore. Even he had a machete and a pole. It was sort of bushwhacking with one arm. Just the most incredible people. And often, people don't give the local guides and porters their due respect and credit. Um, particularly European explorers don't, don't ever remember to, to acknowledge the people that they work with. And it's unfair because all of these expeditions um, to Victorian times and earlier are only possible by working with local people but they're normally the ones that are forgotten. So I, I don't want to do, make that mistake. These people are incredible. And um, particularly that this fellow up front that had gone on despite his injured hand uh, was pretty amazing. Anyway, we finally got back down to the lowlands and um, we had one last glimpse of the summit and uh, had a, a thank you to our, our friends in the, in the lowlands. And this was the peak. We had a clear view of it then all the way up, up on the summit. Uh, you can see to the summit. But that wasn't where the work finished, of course. We, we got back to Puerto Princesa. We had, we'd already received permission to collect a herbarium specimen, and we worked with the State University, the Palo State University, and deposited the specimen in their herbarium. And this was really important because often when plants are discovered, the specimens are taken out of the country of origin to herbaria in, in Europe or North America or, or Australia or, or wherever. And we specifically wanted to, to, to make sure that it stayed with the people in Palawan. And they're the ones that had given us the permission to collect the specimen. And so we, we gave it to, to, to their herbarium. <coughs> and there's Alistair and Volker uh, presenting the, the specimen to our, our friends at the Palawan herbarium. And um, that's the type specimen of the plant, the specimen upon which the description was named. And anyway, it was published. Oh, sorry, I forgot to put that in. It was published in uh, 2010, if I remember correctly. And we, we just thought that it would be like loads of other species that were named that no one really cares about and you know, no one really knows even that they've been named. But we, put, we decided to name it after David Attenborough because he is just such an incredible man. Um, he, he has spent his life trying to drive forward conservation and awareness of the natural world. And we did it genuinely because of that reason and didn't expect anyone to really know or, or, or care about it. But um, perhaps a bit naively in, in retrospect, um, but after it was described for like a week, about 50 newspapers and uh, radio stations and stuff wanted to know about this plant. I think because of Attenborough's name. And as I said, that really wasn't intended. We, we didn't even really give it a thought. But, but, um, but the BBC and like newspapers all over the place um, poor old Sir uh, so David had helped me with different book projects before and I wrote to him and said, I'm really sorry, I had no idea this was going to happen. There was a, there's a really trashy newspaper in the UK called The Sun and it had like Rattenborough and, and, <laughs> and things like that. And I think one of them even, even superimposed Sir David actually in a picture being eaten by the plant. And, um, and one of the, it was, I think it was actually that same trashy newspaper, it's called The Sun, it, I remember, I forget it, it had this tagline saying, Boffins in a jungle have found a new plant. <laughs> and, made it, and I just thought it was a really... <laughs> um, so anyway, so we really honestly weren't expecting this, but loads of newspapers picked it up on it. And I wrote to Sir David, um, 
and he wrote back. I'd already written to him prior to ask permission to name it after him, of course, and he wrote back and he said it, he would be thrilled to the marrow to have it named after him. So we had had his permission to, to name it after him. And um, the next time I went back to Nara, I was very touched to see that actually actually put it on their sign. <laughs> it was the home of the Tenthys Attenborough. <coughs> so they, they were evidently happy to. Um, so um, anyway, that, that was really the story. Um, interestingly, I went on to discover a load of other new plants along the Kalawai. I told you that mountain was only one of a spine of mountains that went all along it. And there were loads of interesting other peaks and stories. I could tell you them another time, but one of them, there's a sister mountain to Mount Victoria, just across a valley. And that one had a very closely related plant, but that was even bigger than Nepenthes atomborough. So we named it Pat Nepenthes palonensis. So these two species, Nepenthes atomborough and Nepenthes palonensis, form a really close pair of species. They're very similar. But interestingly, Nepenthes atomborough produces um, upper pitches almost immediately once it gets you know, to, to a decent size. It, it, it straight away produces upper pitches and only upper pitches. Whereas Nepenthes palawanensis is the opposite. For whatever reason, it produces very few, if any, upper pitches, but produces these gigantic lower pitches. So they're, they're kind of interesting, they're kind of twists, um, but yet yeah, relatively similar. But palawanensis produces these massive reddish lowers that are, are so big. You can, I, I actually took a photo of myself with a hand in it. Someone was very rude in a, in a journal, in the International Congress of Plants Society journal. I had my fist in the, in the picture. Um, but I, I won't say any more about that. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, yeah, the, 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 it was interesting because you don't know what's still out, is out, out there still. There are still literally thousands and thousands of mountains all across the world, but still hundreds and hundreds across the area where the Penthes live that still haven't been, uh, been documented or studied. In fact, literally just this week, I saw someone post some photos of a, of a new species on another Philippine mountain, um, uh, not far from here, not, not in Poland, but nearby. There's another beautiful new species of the Penthes. He had just gone up there and taken a photo and, and not seen it. So by no means think the chapter of exploration is closed. There's some young people here today, and it'll be your generation, that, and possibly even beyond your generation, that, that concludes the exploration um, of, of the world. So, um, anyway, that was just a very brief overview, and thank you very, very much for listening. And um, if you grow this plant, because um, it's widely distributed now in culture, I hope you'll, you'll think of that story ten years ago and enjoy growing it. So, thank you very much.